you from lots of sponsored hosted drinking events, so we'll get right to it. Um, first on the panel, and I have no idea the order they're going to come up, I uh, want to welcome Scott Ferber uh, from uh, Videology. Scott has spent his career utilizing mathematics and information technology, built profitable businesses, co-founded advertising.com, uh, and has also spent time at other Fortune 500 companies such as Procter & Gamble and Capital One. So please welcome Scott. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Next up is uh, Anthony Rizzicato, uh, now general manager at Video Hub. He's been in the industry for 18 years, uh, marrying marketers to technology brands to results and building high performance teams. Uh, previously, Anthony was CEO of Mobile Commons, mobile technology platform. Uh, he spent some time as uh, general manager at Innovation Interactive and also spent some time at DoubleClick. So very good heritage and good history. Welcome, Anthony. Next up is Brett Wilson from TubeMogul. Uh, yes, applause, applause, fine. Uh, serial entrepreneur, uh, created shareholder customer value multiple companies in the late 90s, uh, started an e-commerce company called You Can Save. Uh, also founded Mariner Marketing and spent three years as a technology consultant at Accenture. Welcome, Thanks, Brad. And last but not least, Eric Franchi uh, from Undertone, co-founder, uh, has helped the company become a provider of digital advertising solutions for brand advertisers and premium publishers. Uh, as a member of the executive team, has helped Undertone maintain its reputation as the best place to work in New York City, according to Cranes, and one of the most valuable, valuable private companies in the world. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, we're going to get right into it, talking about uh, video and RTB and programmatic, um, the, the possibilities of what sight, sound, and motion uh, can bring to uh, this, this burgeoning space. And I've kind of uh, put together five questions. We'll see how many we get through in the time that we have. Uh, I've kind of uh, constructed this so that there's a lead-off hitter for each question, and then I encourage everybody to jump in uh, as frequently and as rudely as possible to keep the... Uh, Keep it entertaining. So I'm going to start with Scott. Um, big question right now is that consumption of digital video, as we've all seen, uh, is on a double-digit growth path on a yearly basis. But the digital ad inventory, especially quality digital ad inventory, continues to be a challenge for everybody in the ecosystem, uh, from the providers to the buyers and, and everybody in between. So I'd love to hear your explanation for why that discrepancy continues to exist and what it's going to take to close the gap. So, video. Everyone in the video space, broadcasters and cable networks who make the vast majority of their money in the United States on the 70, give or take, billion dollars of television advertising spend, witness what happened in display. And the big concern they have, and you can debate whether broadcasters and cable networks have premium content or not, but I'm gonna label them as premium content. And their argument, as they've related to me, is that they have scarcity of inventory, and that scarcity of inventory is going to be withheld by them in a way that maximizes their profit, and their big fear is what they perceived to have happened in the display space, where if they took some of their display assets and they had extra liquidity or inventory, and they put it into multiple places to be monetized, and I've heard the word RTB referred to as race to the bottom. Whether that's true or not, in reality, doesn't matter. It's what they're saying. It's their perception. So I, I could argue all sorts of ways on this thing, but the single greatest holdback, to use your term, Chris, of premium inventory, is because of what's happened in display, the fact that there's scarcity in video and the premium content folks don't want to put their stuff into the display-like exchanges that are mostly known for RTB. That said, there is a lot of great video inventory out there in high quality, and it can be used for programmatic buying, where programmatic refers to machine usage, right? We're sitting here using machines to make intelligent decisions based on information. And the guaranteed programmatic, or the reserve space, which is also known as the TV upfronts and TV space, there's lots of that premium inventory at a high cost, the way TV advertisers want to sell it, TV media companies want to sell it. So it's there, it's available, it's available for programmatic, but on the terms that are more similar to the television way of looking at things than as opposed to the digital display landscape. What we typically see, though, is a lot of liquidity in the RTB space with professionally produced content, but it's not the same thing you see on TV. Now, that stuff is great, it has liquidity, there's uh, data with it, you can get a good cost against that, against premium inventory. The big challenge we find is that when you track the metric of offline sales, 
So I show an impression, and in a typical video, the desire is to create a brand experience that then filters through to some experience eventually where a purchase happens. Typically, video is not the call to action, typically. What we find is that when you use video, when you measure the offline sale, the content can have a 200 times difference on actual performance. Let me explain that in exact detail. I put out 1,000 impressions, I get one conversion. I put out 1,000 impressions, I get 200 conversions. That's the difference we see between premium quality, which often has a high expensive price and is associated with things like broadcasters and television cable nets, and professionally produced content that has great video, but is not the stuff we see on TV. So you can get it for cheaper, there still is liquidity out there, there's still data, the back-end performance has a significant difference. And the best way to overcome that, in my opinion, is to service the publisher side, give them the right tools, and if we can give them the tools and the insights to bring their media into this marketplace, then the media supply will grow as fast as the consumer consumption. All right. To put some numbers to it, at the, uh, I guess as a, as a buy-side platform, we sit on top of all of the, the biddable marketplaces of inventory. At the end of last year, I think we saw about 10 billion real-time biddable impressions per month. At the beginning of last year, we saw 1 billion per month. So that was a 10x increase in, in one year. And I think Scott's right that uh, there, there's a publisher perception that when you put your inventory into these marketplaces that it's gonna commoditize your inventory. And in the display, sp display space, that was true because display DSPs they commoditize media because they're all about targeting audiences. But in the brand space, all the research that's out there says that context still matters, that the site still matters. So that means that video DSPs or programmatic buyers of video are much more aligned with publishers than display DSPs are. And I think that's gonna to continue to drive the, the, the inventory uh, that's available for real-time bidding. But there's no incentive for the publishers to, to put their inventory into uh, these environments, right? Because it's high sell-through. It's high sell-through on a direct basis and with premium CPM. So until we, I don't know if it's aligning with the publishers or it's redefining what quality video is, I, I think we're just going to see this, right? I think Scott nailed it where it's like the, um, you know, the FEP, the you know the, the the TV stuff is I mean that that's being held back right and 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 they can hold it back because it's scarce and it's being moved at good CPMs and and there, there's high demand for it um, and there's liquidity with other types of video that's professionally produced and not dogs on skateboards and, and everything like that um, and that's not being bought right and it's not being bought because brand marketers uh, you know are thinking that the TV stuff is is what they need to be buying and and if there's data to to show that other types of prof professionally produced video can drive brand results, we need to be doing a better job of, of evangelizing that in the marketplace. But, but isn't the issue really, uh, you know, from an inventory standpoint, is that we've been solving for the wrong problem, right? We, we continue to focus on how do we go and find more premium inventory that can go into RTB to be bidded on an exchange through DSP, et cetera, and then we are sort of hoping that the broadcasters and the content owners will come along. They'll just uh, suddenly wake up one day and be like, oh, all that other good stuff is in there. We should be in there too. But the issue is really that we haven't solved their problem, right, which is proving value to the brand marketer, which is where they make their money. Outside of Quibids and Lava Life, which I see every night after Jon Stewart, um, it, it, television is, is primarily a, a brand awareness medium, exactly uh, as, as Scott was saying. So, it feels like, and I've been here all day listening to RTB, and it's awesome, and it's great, and I think it's gonna be an important part of the ecosystem, but we're not really solving the problem that matters to the larger scale marketing ecosystem. We're, we're sort of racing around here in, in the bottom, who can I get more inventory from, and how can I bid it a little bit faster? And I, I don't, I have never, ever, ever met an agency who had a problem spending money. So the argument that RG, RTB just makes it easier to spend this with less friction. Any agency people out here have a problem spending budget? Just raise your hands, please. Okay. It happens from time to time. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> well, um, ask, ask the agency people here yeah. if they're able to spend all the budget that they could on video the way that their client wants them to spend. And I would say that it's a challenge. Right, but it's not the pricing mechanism. And, and that's where I think we're missing it as, as an industry. It's not because of how they're buying it. 
it's because there haven't, we haven't proved the value to the people who want to spend the money. Sure. So, so sure. this is actually a beautiful segue, and Anthony, You're welcome. I'd, love to, I'd love for you to lead off the next question, because what, we, what we've said is that programmatic video arguably has the best chance of shifting those perceptions for the sake of the entire RTB, and I know it's not the same as programmatic, but this, this new sort of realm of audience buying and machine-based uh, buying. So what would you say should be the primary effectiveness metrics to shift those perceptions and start putting, whether it be case studies or just announcements in, you know, in, in the press, in, in the industry, that could help shift those perceptions. What should we be looking at? Right, so, so whenever we, at least for me, whenever I look at these things, I, I try and ask myself who's, who, two questions. One, what problem are you solving? And we covered that. And the other is who benefits? And in a pure auction that's purely price, really the only one who benefits is the auctioneer. Right? And so if we go down the RTB path that we're currently going down, which is mimicking what happened in display and search, the only person who benefits is Google. Right? And they will own this. And that's great. I love Google. It's fantastic. I've owned the stock for years. Mazel tov. But if we want to build out a real, vibrant, RTB-based business that brings in the brand marketer, then we have to focus on bidding for brand awareness, bidding for favorability bidding for engagement and allowing the brand, marker, the, the brand marketer the absolute transparency into what they are getting out of that bid. And the question came up in the last panel, uh, this sort of opacity uh, that exists within the exchanges. Enough already, okay? There, there, there is no technological reason why we can't know where something runs. And if you're buying and someone's not telling you where it's running, Stop buying there, okay? I don't care what the pr price doesn't matter at that point, right? You're, you're taking a risk with your brand, and whether you're a publisher or on the, on the buy side, we work for the brands ultimately. You're going to disagree. No, 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 I was going to agree. I, I mean, if you think of video as, as kind of the, the ultimate kind of uh, ad format for branding, what you care about metrics-wise is did you reach the right people, did you reach your target audience, and did you persuade them? And that's where we need to do a better job as, as an industry is, is giving persuasion metrics, like you said. Uh, is this person who is not going to buy my product online because I'm a brand and I sell things that, that you don't buy online typically, are they more likely to buy? Are they more likely to, to remember me? And those are, those are really the only two metrics that, that I think brands need. Uh, just to, so here's one. I actually think that in order to make this thing happen, we have to go exactly where display started, which was, this is the best ultimate direct response medium. That was my premise for founding advertising.com. And the premise, just to be quick, was customers pay me when I get you a customer. And you only pay me per customer. Because at the end of the day, when you're a marketer, all you care about is how much did it cost for me to get my sale? And what is the value of that customer? You can use net present value for financial person or whatever it is. I work for Procter & Gamble arguably the largest marketer in the world. One thing they cared about, one, how much soap was off the shelf because of what we did. That's sales. So what we have to do, and whether it's true or not, once again, I'll defer to people like Chris and, and the people that work at the agencies and that mindset, it's believed by 50 years prior to me that TV sells product and that it's incredibly efficient in selling product, which is why people who don't have direct relationships with customers like Procter & Gamble and Unilever, major car companies, all use TV to sell their products because they don't have a direct relationship. They got to use TV to convince them. At the end of the day, what's my cost per sale? So if we're to be successful, if we can get the single largest spenders in the television world to all say, and I'll just pick online video, whatever you want to call it, right? Streaming video, mobile video, sight, sound, emotion, multi-device, cross-channel, Throw out every buzzword you want. When we can show that that stuff actually sells product equal or more efficiently than what television does, that's the thing that's going to win the day. So I would argue if we can go back to what we started with the digital premise, and it's a big deal because who the heck's going to say, I showed a video ad, 10 months later someone bought a car or five years later someone bought a car. But that's the ultimate holy grail. And if we can accomplish that, we will change everything in this industry. And that is, in my opinion, the ultimate thing that we need to accomplish for video is to show them that true offline sales return on investment occurs, and it occurs in a great way, and then things will flood. Okay, so, so that's an impossibility. That's a great talking point. That's awesome. Love it, Scott. Impossibility, right? Just like you can't show that in television today, 
despite 60 years of people trying to, to do that. How they do it is by modeling, by measuring brand awareness, by measuring favorability, intent to purchase. That is what you can do online if you're measuring the things that are important. If you're bidding a dollar and then you think you're doing better by bidding 90 cents and you don't know the other side of it is what you're getting out of that and what the transparency is and if that's driving brand awareness, then that, it's a waste of time, right? So bidding for bidding's sake only benefits the auctioneer, not the brand and not the... We have actually tied offline sales to online video. Anyone wants to talk scale, about it, come see me later. At scale. huge scale yeah. across the United States of America a for maybe multiple Maybe guys. I know Eric wants to jump actually in. Actually, universal. We could do it on Mars also. I, I, I thought that we, we were about to hear an announcement that, that advertising.com is back as a, as a video <laughs> CPA network. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, you have to talk to Ned Birdie. <laughs> Um, I, I think it's very simple, right? And, and I do think Scott is on something in terms of um, speaking the language that the brand marketer uh, needs us to speak, right? And, and I, um, I don't know if it's necessarily being able to convince them that through this video campaign that ran for eight weeks and was $200,000, this moved sales incrementally. That might be a challenge, but love to see the data. Um, but if we can talk to them in their language about you reached this audience, right? There was this level of engagement to the point that Brett was saying before, you know, brand metrics, right? Lift and purchase intent and everything like that. We're getting a heck of a lot closer. So I don't think there's any crazy metrics we need, we need to produce. I just think we need to speak the brand marketer's language um, and I think be more TV-like than online display-like. So, so to circle back, I probably fully disagree that we need to make it like display just fundamentally that it's like, hey, spend this amount of money, you will generate this amount of sales. I think it's more complicated and nuanced with video and it needs to be more like TV. Which I would argue is exactly evaluated like display is. How much money did I spend and how much sales did I get? I'm just making that argument. Yeah, we've well, been talking display, to Dave yeah, Morgan again. It's like post, no, po post click, do, post view, you know, it's not off, off the shelves. Okay, again, the business you, guys, is represented you guys are here, making I mean. this as organic and smooth as I could have hoped for. This is beautiful. I love it. Because right now we're going to talk about the online GRP. We're going to talk about do we want to be more like TV or do we want to forge ahead with uh, more of what Scott was talking about where we are a different medium, we are theoretically a more accountable medium, and we should be a more exact medium when it comes to telling you who you reached, how many times, and, and did it actually tie to something. So, uh, Brett, where, where, do you, where do you fall on that conversation? I think that advertisers have a right to know that they actually reach the audience that, that they were targeting. And in TV, the GRP works really well because it's a standardized metric, it's validated by a third party, so it's become this currency which enables uh, an, an efficient TV buying economy. What we're seeing happening right now in digital is there's a couple emerging audience validation technologies. Nielsen has one, Comscore has one. And we're seeing advertisers demand um, you know, from publishers and other sources of media that when they do a buy, they only reach 100% of their target audience. So what's happening is this is driving down the eCPMs for publishers and sources of media because they're having to deliver more total impressions to deliver the on-target impressions that they promised. You can imagine that advertisers aren't very sympathetic because these publishers have been telling them for years that this is the audience that, that, that they're selling. What, what's missing from the conversation is the concept of wastage. And this is the notion that even with the best, uh, most advanced kind of uh, online targeting technology, you're never gonna be 100% accurate. And I think until GRP pricing online kind of takes into account wastage, then it never works for both advertisers and publishers. If assuming that happens, then yes, it, it's a great metric because uh, we are seeing more TV buyers in the space. The idea of a GRP means that you could buy digital video uh, and measure it on an equivalent basis with, with TV. And, uh, and that would shift a, a ton of money from TV into digital video. We got to do it. We, we, we got to do it, right? so, so, we, we need to speak the on. brand marketer's language in order to um, bring, bring budgets online. It's, it's as simple as that. And if 2013 becomes a um, investment year in catching up with the brand marketer's desire and TV buyer's desire to um, you know, ser serve the GRP, right, as a, as a common metric, 
let's just do it. I mean, we just need to figure out how to make, um, how to make the, the, the online audiences match up with the Nielsen data. And we've done stuff like this before. I well, mean, we, you know, we need to figure out who the third party validator is going to be. It's going to, yeah. Could I mean, be Nielsen, be the, could be Comscore. Yeah, it's going to be who the, who the marketer but, wants, right? But until right? there's a standard, the, the yeah. digital GRP won't take off. We, we've done it before. But way back in the day, right, when Scott and I were, were, were just doing display stuff, there were significant discrepancies in just third party ad serving. So I think about it like that. We all figured out how to reduce latency and, and, and do all that stuff to where now display discrepancies are very, very, very minimal. I know we're talking about audiences and it's a whole different beast, but we need, just need to put the technology to work and, and, and ultimately we need to get move closer to what the brand marketers want and, and make this medium as easy to buy as TV and as easy to shift budgets from TV, right? It's all about that. It's all about getting that share. And let's just make it easy. Let's grease the wheels. Isn't the GRP uh, debate kind of over? I mean, we're, we're there. So, 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 yeah. yeah I mean, it's we incorporated GRPs a, a, a year and 14 months ago, um, and they're not digital GRPs or eGRPs or. Well, the conversation is about the audience guarantees. They're GRPs. And, and, and are, is this is this going to crush us on our way to to get there? I think that's that's the conversation. It, it's not over because. Different agencies and different publishers use different technologies to validate the audience. And until you have a single validator, then you're not operating on a common currency. When it becomes the common currency, that's when the GRP becomes effective. Yeah. Uh, once again, I think the GRP is great. If you ask TV buyers, they love the GRP, but they actually arguably would care, and there's some who care more about the GRP, but most of them care about the TRP. So, so my comment, the original part is, I think the target rating point is more of the key metric that they're trying to drive for, even though the GRP is important. Second quick comment is, is that GRP has been out there, everyone's liking it, it hasn't been enough. Because people, I think that you just said this real quickly, what's the GRP online worth of the GRP offline and are they the same? And forget the denominators and numerators, is a video ad shown on a PC, 15 second in stream, full episode player, the same as that video ad yeah. on a TV. Of course not. Right? Yeah. I, I, we need to I'm, figure that one out. Right, so that's another, I'm just adding another element to the dynamic of yep. how do I yep. come up with, with the value of a GRP. So those are kind of things that are still playing in the marketer's head and I still go back to, I don't want to make video display because I think where display has come is actually not the place it should be. I was going back to the original premise that if we can evaluate marketing based on its true attribution and effectiveness, that's where we need to be. And, and my biggest comment is the GRP, top of the marketing funnel, targeted awareness, message association, recall, unaided recall, purchase intent, phenomenal. All those are great. We have multiple tools from multiple vendors to help assess that. That is driving incremental spend. If we can just prove the ROI component on sales, that's where I think the floodgates open. So I just want to make it clear. I hope no one here thinks I think video should go the digital way of display. I just think if we can go to the point of proving ROI for offline sales, that it will, everything all four of us want to do is have that floodgate open. The GRP is a nice beginning, the TRP is the next big one, purchase intent, all the things you said, and then hopefully, not perfect, like you said, I'll never be able to track Mars sales. But if we can have a directional understanding that this is more valuable, then I think that's where this whole thing goes. Appreciate it. I mean, I think the expectation on, the, the continuous since the dawn of time expectation on digital be more perfect more accountable, more exact, I think keeps this debate very much alive. I think uh, for a lot of folks, the GRP is a guess. It's a good guess, but it's a guess. And we so, so, you, so you, you don't agree? Uh, no. I mean, I, I so would, you don't think GRP? I would love, I mean, again, it's not my, it's not, I'm not a panelist. My, you're, my, you're the boss. My role guy. here is yes. to facilitate, yeah. but uh, I think the other side of the debate is always and will always be uh, more to what Scott's talking about. If we can, we believe that we have the ability to see it all the way through, or at least a better ability to see the journey all the way through to the end. And if we can continue to do that, it, that may be a more effective means of shifting share, if that's what we're interested in, uh, rather than simply saying, all right, we'll do it your way and hope for the best. But again, pricing continues to be a little, you know, CPPs can still go either way, digital video versus TV in a lot of ways. So you know, it'll continue to be a debate. However, we talk about the, the uh, convergence of, of video and display. Some people want it, some people don't. I would love to talk about in-banner video. Um, as a planner at MediaVest, I uh, was working with InBanner Video back in 2004. Uh, it, was, it was a new thing on the scene at the time. Seemed like a very efficient way to get sight, sound, and motion into a targetable, uh, you know, somewhat versatile uh, channel. Now it seems to have become a dirty word. Um, I'd love to hear first from Eric. Um, you know, kind of, if you have seen that shift happen, if you're hearing these types of things, is there still a role for InBanner Video? Is it is it a viable medium, or is it simply? Uh, 
persona non grata these days? Yeah, it's still a viable medium. Um, it's, a way for, uh, it's a way for us to, I think, get more out of a standard banner space. Um, a few years ago, there were people uh, in the space that were passing off in banner video as user initiated, and that's not good. And they were called out, brand marketers got burned, and um, yeah, that's, that's why it's a dirty word today. Um, you know, fast forward a couple of years, there's companies that are doing things with technology like Two Mogul um, to give the assurance, undertone, we give a money back guarantee, you know, um, to ensure user initiated, but that's what, ha that's what happened. Um, you know, we, we also did some studies, and you can get this at, at our website, undertone.com, that um, showed that in banner for a couple of brand metrics is actually more effective than user initiated, just for, for a couple metrics. I'm not, I'm not saying it's better at all. And, you know, there's the cost difference, and you, know, you can evaluate on an economic basis, but um, the reason why it became a bad word, and, and I think we're, we're past this, because I think a lot of the players that were doing this are either no longer operating in the space or can't do this stuff because of technology and, and guarantees or demands by the brand advertisers. Um, yeah, it was, it was because there was such a imbalance of supply and demand that you saw people trying to capitalize on it and running autoplay in banner, sometimes completely out of view, oftentimes with the sound off. So just like a stuff that's just running across the exchange you can buy for pennies on the dollar, um, charging premium CPMs for it and selling it back to brand advertisers. So that's where the dirty word came from. Um, but again, I think, I think that, that stuff be, you know, with technology and with, with business assurances and, and transparency, that's, that's no more. And, and I think it's like, I mean, it's a great way to make display work harder, right? Have, have, a, have a click button on top of a, of a 300 by 600, um, an expandable point, unit. Right? That, that's yeah. just the point. As long as it's yeah, clearly there's good differentiated, use yeah. as long as it's separated clearly, Correct. because that is not a video ad yeah. as defined by, you know, if you're watching television, you get a full screen ad, and then a the little bug shows up when you're watching a show, that's not the same. Yeah. Right? So as long as they're differentiated, I'm a platform. I, you know, you run whatever marketing you want. For, for sure. But the, the problem was brand marketers, you know, weren't getting the transparency into placements. So. Okay, I, I think we're not out of the woods on this issue at all. Really? We, we see uh, video ad networks every day bundle in autoplay in banner video with, with user initiated video. Um, so the brands often don't know uh, what they bought. Last year, we, we launched a website called fakepreroll.com, and, and we started showcasing just some of the, these ad formats. We quickly got two cease and desist letters from, from different ad networks, and one of them went as far as saying, look, the IAB's definition of an in-stream video is a video followed by another video, even if it's auto-playing in a banner. So they actually justified it. They, they weren't even hiding it. So what we did, we built a piece of technology that looks at the player size, and, and the player size is an almost perfect proxy to, to figure out whether or not uh, a video is running in banner exactly. or not. 300 by 250. That's right. Or, or, or Put smaller. all the syndicated content and all that stuff that too yeah. many people like to do here. But in-banner video has none of the properties of, of, of video, right? Video is interruptive, it's immersive, uh, it, it, it's by definition viewable, uh, and in-banner video just shouldn't be in, in the same conversation. But if it's still going on, please, buyers, ask if you're getting a blended video product, meaning user-initiated in addition to autoplay, um, and if you are, if the answer is yes, ask for the breakout, ask for a breakout in pricing. Um, there's just no reason for this to happen. If so I uh, like their hand raising, that way I'm going to interrupt. That's very nice. Um, Exactly. Welcome back. So a couple comments. One, if you look back, we bought, uh, we did some testing on this. It's a third of the price for one-tenth of the performance. It's not perfect. It's not everything. Third of the price, one-tenth of the performance. What are your metrics? Click-through rate, these are digital things that people care about. Just for a minute. I know I'm the guy talking about offline sales. <laughs> but high level, when you bought in-banner video and you were trying to compare it to in-stream, just in banner versus in stream, it cost only a it cost one third as much, but it had one tenth of the performance. So from an, from a generic back of the envelope, didn't work as well. I think there were some issues. Second thing, I want to concur with what my esteemed colleagues have said. Unfortunately, some of this inventory has made it through and been packaged up in a way that some people have gotten burned. Right. So there's that too. Third thing I wanted to say is what is in banner video, right? So I remember we talked about syndicated player content. It's not in banner video. 
at least according to every media guy that goes out there and syndicates their content, they don't think their syndicated player is in banner video. But what if it's in a but if it's in a 300 by 250 <laughs> player, then what is that? Well, if you have a technology that only looks at player size, you're in a, up a creek without a paddle because you're going to misclassify in banner video. So there's multiple elements to this concept of what is in banner video and understanding and sussing it out. We're early in video. In banner video is a phenomenal opportunity because it was an improvement on display. We went from static images to JPEG, and, I mean, and GIF, to Flash, and now we've got even better Flash. That's good stuff. We still just need to evolve, in my opinion, the understanding of each element of inventory and its value. I would argue that if you want low-cost GRPs, gross rating points that we discussed up here, and you're a TV buyer, and banner video is going to be phenomenal for you, assuming you have some of these quality metrics in place, because that's what you're going to get, low-cost GRPs. So I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you care about click-through rate and you have a cost per click you're trying to achieve, you might not be that okay on Inbanner Video. Maybe you will be. That's how we have to look at Inbanner Video, based on the objectives. Anthony, you want to jump in? Something about viewability, maybe? Yeah, the, the, the viewability thing is, is, again, it comes back to some basic premises and principles. You know, um, Are we being transparent with our buyers and sellers? Um, you know, we, we've tracked viewability, you know, through our platform again for a year, and it's horrific, some of the stuff we see. Um, I concur with Anne, a comm score, who was talking about this a little bit earlier. You know, it's in, and I think you were talking about primarily display, but in the video piece, it's even more critical, right? Because that content is leaving if it's not in view. And so we've developed this whole system to be able to look very easily and clearly. What size is the player? Is it in view? How long is it in view? <laughs> What's the position on the page? These are all things that can be known and should be known. And as a buyer out there, or if you're a seller or a publisher, and you're not providing that or not getting that, then you need to ask some questions about really where are you running. Um, and again, I'm talking about in-stream video. I think video and banner is a display product, and it has its use, but it's a different animal. Um, and you have to know these things, because guess what? If you can't see it, it doesn't drive brand lift. It will get you some reach metrics, right? Because you're going to drop a cookie on that. But if you're really measuring the things that matter to a brand marketer, favorability, brand awareness, engagement, et cetera, you have to have a viewable ad, and you should be tracking those things. So it's, it's, I think it's critically important. I, I frankly think it's table stakes moving forward. Um, I think the IAB will come out with the video piece, and I think uh, some companies up here might actually get certified by the MRC for viewability. I couldn't imagine who that's going to be. Um, but that's going to be table stakes moving forward. All right. Thank you, guys. We have a little bit of time left. I'd love to open it up for questions from the audience. Right here. The young lady standing up. Right over here. here row two. Oh, it's Stage right. right. The lights are right. <laughs> The lights are pointing in there. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Lauren Grant. I'm actually with Viviki. Um, I have actually come from a television background, and I find it very interesting, these discussions about video and aligning it with television and where we are in the middle of this process. Um, do you think it's possibly too late? Um, there's all this discussion about a TRP and a GRP, and it's like everyone in video or online video woke up and was like, there's tons of money to be made in television. Let's go all model ourselves after what they're selling in television. And so I just, I find the conversation, you know, again, I'm really new to this industry, a little late. And so I wonder if kind of this implementation of all of these metrics is a little late in the process for you to align yourselves and whether or not you need to be kind of that in-between medium between display and television. You know, I wish we would have talked uh, two and a half years ago when we launched the platform. That would have been great. Um, you know, listen, I, I, I agree with you. There, seem, there feels like a bandwagon effect here. Um, but the one thing that hasn't changed is that brands have always asked, what am I getting out of X? What am I getting out of that carving on the wall? What am I getting out of that print ad? You know, what is Madman getting for me? Um, and RTB, and th this is what drives me a little crazy about the conversation, RTB doesn't solve for that because we don't speak the language of the traditional marketer in digital, right? So RTB is just a tactic for spending money. It's an important one, but we have to adopt the language of the marketer. And guess what? 
they have an awful lot of money and have been very successful in what they're doing. And as I like to say, for 15 years, I've been throwing traditional marketers under the table because I've been a digital guy all my life. Um, I've had my come to Jesus moment, right? I realize it's the brand marketer asking the question, what am I getting that we have to answer? Um, consumer view. I don't think we in the industry, I'm a business to business person like all of you here, have a choice. TV is merging and converging. So even if I want, on a business point of view, to stay in the middle of TV and display or something, I, and I say that's a great place to be, I don't think I have the luxury to say that. And the reason is, is that people are consuming stuff everywhere. And it's just happening with all the computers and devices. The iPhone didn't exist six years ago. Look at Facebook is now the number one app. And the iTunes store just overtook Google's uh, 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 map thing today. I think if you guys saw that release out, wow! Right? Look at the rise of Netflix in a series of years. So my concern is, uh, while it might be nice to put it in between things, I don't think the consumer mindset and its evolution is going to allow us to do that. That's right. Yeah, it's, 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 it's happening whether we like it or not from a consumer perspective. Everything's becoming digital. All, all video is becoming digital. Um, we collectively, you know, t TV and, and online need, need to figure this thing out. I was smiling before. We haven't even talked about RTB. No, no. We haven't even talked about programmatic. <laughs> We're talking about GRPs this whole time. <laughs> Um, it's a very TV panel. Very TV oriented well, panel. I, I've been doing our, our TV panels and it gets kind of stale. Yeah, so yeah, well, but, but, yeah. Listen, to be yeah. serious, though, because it's, I, I, it's not the big problem, right? It's, 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 it's a part of the mix. It's on the menu, but it's not the big problem. The big problem is proving the value. So we should talk a little bit about programmatic, right? Uh, so I'm Alex Murrow in with Spot Exchange. My question for you guys is, you know, in display, big buzzword, programmatic premium, deal ID, we talked about it a little bit earlier today. But do you guys think there's an opportunity in video to unlock some of that, you know, characteristically premium inventory that's really, you know, in the upfront network ecosystem today to the exchange-based, audience-based, programmatic environment? I definitely think there is. Huge opportunity. I just don't know if it's going to be in the RTB space that that display has had. I think the idea is that you can take an upfront guaranteed buy, and then you can use programmatic capabilities to manage those upfront buys across a portfolio of advertisers. And I think that's, that's what TV is doing. TV goes out, they negotiate a big thing, and they run a bunch of advertisers against that. Uh, it's not as programmatic. One may argue there's a ton of math and science to it, but that's the concept that I think that exists in a, in a big, big way here, and that is happening in a huge way in this industry today, in my yeah. opinion. At least that's what we're doing. But for the really high-end stuff, due to inventory scarcity and no incentive for the publishers to put it in there, today, no. Um, in the future, as again, everything's becoming digital, and um, it's almost like we all need to figure this thing out. Yes, and I think the private exchange model of leveraging some technology to make digital easier to buy, right during the upfront, I think I think is very realistic to think about. But I just think not not today. It's just there's no reason for the publishers to put it out there. They're selling it. We're seeing it happen in a big way, and the publishers don't care. It's not an exchange. I'm talking about like the TV broadcasters. Yeah, we're seeing it happen because advertisers. What percentage of your inventory is that? It's not our inventory. It's, of the it's inventory that's deals getting bought. between the advertiser and publisher where the, the economics were between the advertiser and the publisher. It's not bidded per se, but the advertiser wants to buy programmatically. And why would they not? So sure. a company like, like a tube model or a videology comes in, and, and we just make it software enabled. Yep. It's not real-time bidded, but we make it easy to buy. You can use data across your buy, uh, one set of reporting. Uh, and, and I think it's it's really the future of video because so much of it is premium in nature. Yeah, we're, we're agreeing, man. It's it's um it's just the the super premium TV broadcaster stuff, which I believe you were referring to of those ten billion impressions. How many were that? Those were how many open marketplace how many? impressions. <laughs> well, the ten billion impressions. That's what we're because you know all the publishers open marketplaces. Mm -hmm. So the most premium publishers, they're not putting their inventory in open marketplaces. Right. Exactly. But what, what's happening is if an advertiser says, I'm going to do a flighted guaranteed buy with you, but I want to do it through a technology, publisher doesn't care. Mm -hmm. what, why would they care? Okay. So what percentage of the inventory is coming from the top quality TV broadcaster stuff that we've been talking about? Um, of our top clients, I, I think most of them are doing their, their guaranteed mm -hmm. uh, premium and kind of open buys through Got us. It. I don't know what percentage it is. Oh, yeah, I'd like to just back up to that problem solving question and talk about RTB, but also talk about it not just as race to the bottom, but the concept of programmatic trading. 
And I want, I would like to ask, I would actually I'd like to ask some buyers, but we have a, a vendors panel here. Um, I mean, everything I'm told from the agency side is that they have less resources to do more work and that there is a lot of inventory. It's not as scarce as you think. There are things like video on demand and digital spectrum channels and networks that are adding a lot to their workload. And the reason they want to use programmatic and technology is because they need to manage it. The reason why agencies adopted television audience optimizers in the 90s wasn't because they wanted computers to, to do what humans did before. It's that they couldn't, humans couldn't do it anymore. At that point, in 1995, if you just took cable and broadcast television, the permutations that were involved were like four point something trillion. Right? Yes! <laughs> anyway, uh, no, keep so going. What's the you question? Don't, so, you don't see, so you don't see the need to, solve, to use programmatic trading to solve the problem of buying all this supply? For, for sure, absolutely. Um, I'm talking about the type of inventory that the gentleman over there was asking about. When, when are we going to see that come into the ecosystem? Chris's first question, when are we going to see that come to the ecosystem? When will we unlock that type of inventory and there's just not enough of it or it's being held back and being sold in an upfront manner? But for all the rest of the stuff, like the billions of impressions that, that is flowing through to Mogul and these other platforms, it's, it's great. But, but you're confusing RTB versus programmatic. No, not. It's happening. I mean, we know more and more demand is shifting to programmatic. And if that's where the demand is, then... Uh, yeah, and and publishers have nothing to lose. I'm talking about a segment of the, the just, I, kept, I keep going back to that question yeah. and then the first question. I'm talking about a segment of the market. Is the programmatic space growing for video? Absolutely, yeah. You guys are growing, everybody, everybody's growing, for sure. I'm just talking about that one segment of the market, that's yeah. all. Back to your question, Joe, about sort of solving, the these guys want to go outside and fight it out, so we're going to let them <laughs> do that. Um, and my, my we're going to do it right Eric, here. Because Brett's sick, by the way, so Eric gets my money today. Um, <laughs> solving the problem is, is there, there's, a, there's a nuance to your question, right? Which is, why are agencies or buying groups moving towards programmatic? And, and there's, in my humble opinion, there's a couple of reasons. One, things are getting more complex, right? And there's just a lot more places to buy and a lot more formats, et cetera. So there's some sense of that. But it's also the agency model as a whole coming under pressure in the last 10 years. And, and a programmatic approach to them, a trading desk approach for them, is a way for them to defend their business model. And, and listen, I, I'm 100% believe in agencies and I want them to be around forever because I think they do heroic work for brands. They do things that brands could never, ever do. But I don't think that approach, solving the problem for themselves, is scalable long term. Because the brands get smarter over time and they're gonna ask the same question again. What am I getting out of this? And ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. So, you know, if you, your question is actually is nuanced and a little bit more sophisticated than you're letting on, um, but there's two big reasons for why that's happening. And it's, it's gonna exist. I just want to concur, uh, if, if television and advertising and, and decisioning was really complex, think about the complexity of having real-time biddable exchanges, upfront inventory, 50 different data partners, unbelievable amounts of inventory sources, and all the combinatorics associated with that. It's, it's 10 to the 50, the size of the problem. And uh, as we all know, human beings, it's hard to manage that. It's, it's our brains. We're not wired that way. So computer algorithms, for sure, and that's what we base that.com and what I did for videology. Use computers to do things humans can't because they're better at it. Great. Second element, I think, goes back to what you said also, they have to do more with less. And those are the two trends. How do I take an increasingly complex thing and I need programmatic tools to help me manage it better? And two, I'm being asked to do more, my margins are being squeezed, and I've got fewer people to do it with. So technology, at least we all believe holistically, is a way to do it. I think those are the two, two of the big drivers for why programmatic is going to be big in this space. I think the third thing, just to give you the buyer's perspective, and I think it was discussed on the previous panel, so long as audiences continue to fragment, so long as it's harder to find them, the programmatic will be the solution to making that simpler. And that, we don't see any sign of that abating at this point. I think there's one more yep. question back here. Hi, I'm Layla Borak from Google Ad Exchange. Uh, so quick question, and I think this has been really fascinating, so uh, thanks for chatting with us about video. Um, so I guess the big theme of today has been talking, has been pointing to singularity and making buying via RTB a simpler process, less friction. Um, and I think I, I really appreciated your point, um, Scott, about making video, understanding the real getting factors for video, um, telling our, our buyers that we need to understand and, and push the point of view that there is a lot of value in this video product. So I think you talked about making metrics more pertinent to video. So display metrics that we consider conventional now don't apply to video. So that would kind of um, make, make our market a little more uh, segmented, 
I guess I would say. So how do we juxtapose the segmentation of video with the idea that we should make things more singular and easier to buy on our TV? Uh, uh, just real quickly, I'll do the first one on this one. So uh, each medium and each marketing objective has its own set of metrics and ability to measure. So if I want to do brand awareness, I have an objective called brand awareness. If I have sale, I have an objective called sale, and there's different metrics for it. My view is, unfortunately, while I love to have one metric for everything, I, it won't work. So I still think we need to live in the framework where there's multiple metrics depending on the objectives. And I don't think there's any other way, other, any other way around that. So um, and if you want to use multiple medium for the same objective, then you can have the same metric. And that's important to, to rally around what the end goal is, a sort of outcome-based marketing, which we've seemed to have forgotten um, in this, this sort of data tyranny that we sometimes live in. Um, deciding what you're trying to get out of this and then segmenting your efforts behind the outcome for that and then segmenting your efforts behind, you know, I need to get clicks because I want to sell TiVos, you know, and you can do all of, yeah, all your KPIs could be lined up behind that. But it's important, I think, again, as a buyer who's managing brands and brand campaigns is that you kind of step back a little bit from the overwhelming crush of choice here um, because what we're doing is marketing, right? There was an earlier comment about putting curiosity into Mars. On, we're not doing that. We're marketers, right? We're, we're trying to put ads in front of people at the right time. And so sometimes I think we get a little crazy with the amount of data that we can apply to it. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much to Oma, to Joe, to the panelists for joining us to talk about video today. Enjoy Thank this Chris. evening. We'll talk soon. Thank Chris.